Um, so I hope that what I'm going to say will give you an idea of a different kind of unlimited life and, um, well, perhaps a complementary kind, because I think that what you've just heard very much uh, goes towards um, allaying some of the fears that some people have about the possibility of living a lot longer than anyone has lived yet. But my focus here, since I'm a biologist, will be on how we're going to let you live a physically unlimited life. Uh, I am interested in helping people not to get sick as they get older. A lot of the people that interview me, and a lot of what you may have read and, and seen about my work, is something of a misrepresentation in that it focuses on the outcome of all of this work, namely the possibility of living a very long time. And for that reason, I want to start by emphasizing that that's not what I work on. I do not work on longevity. I work on health. I'm interested in stopping people from getting the diseases and disabilities of old age as they get older, whether it's Alzheimer's or cardiovascular disease or cancer or diabetes or anything like that. Please raise your hand if you want to get Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Please raise your hand if you think there is some age at which you will want to get Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> There's someone over here who just raised his hand, but he put it down again very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, so here's the thing. Pretty much nobody wants to get sick, however long ago they happen to have been born. And therefore, it's really pretty bizarre that we don't put more effort into stopping people from getting sick, into trying to figure out how medically to alleviate the risk of getting sick as we get older. But that's how things are. This is one of the reasons why it's such a bad idea to let people get sick as they get older. These are statistics from the United States, but it's the same here in Austria, it's the same pretty much everywhere in the industrialized world. Uh, the um, <clears throat> red line here is the growth of gross domestic product in the USA, the size of the economy. And the blue line is the rise in medical expenditure. The green line is simply the ratio of the two. So as you can see, it used to be back in 1960 or so that only about 5% of the American economy was dedicated to medical care. And now it's something like 18%. It's an economic tragedy and crisis it's the reason why pension schemes are going bankrupt and so on. So even if you don't even think about the humanitarian issue, the suffering that is caused by the ill health of old age, it's quite, a bad, quite bad news. And of course, this actually raises an interesting question. Why have we succeeded so poorly in postponing the diseases and disabilities of old age? We've done really well over the past one or two hundred years in figuring out how to stop people from getting bad infections at any age, pretty much. It's obviously, you get more infections when you're older, but still, we're really good at this compared to how we used to be. Just by inventing good sanitation and vaccines and antibiotics and mosquito nets and such like, you know, so what's the deal? Why are the diseases of old age so much harder to address? Ultimately, it's because they are not diseases in the sense that tuberculosis is a disease. These diseases of old age are diseases of old age because they are simply aspects of the later stages of aging, the later stages of a process that goes on throughout life as a side effect of being alive in the first place, a side effect of the body's normal operation. We can define aging in a very simple, down-to-earth way, as I've done on this slide here. It's the lifelong accumulation of damage. S damage to our cells, damage to the molecules inside and outside our cells, and that damage occurs intrinsically as a side effect of the complicated things that the body has to do to keep us alive from one day to the next. The reason most people in this room are not suffering from the diseases of old age is because the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of that damage. But eventually, we have more damage than what we're set up to tolerate, and that's when we start getting sick. So it's bizarre, it's completely bizarre that this truth that I've just given you, this simple fact, is so unappreciated. It's not even unfamiliar, because it's exactly the same as the aging of a simple man-made machine, like a car or an airplane. And yet, 
what we have here now is, since we've pretty much got rid of the infectious diseases as a cause of death in the industrialized world, we've got incredibly widespread prevalence of these diseases. About 90% of all medical care and all death is caused by the diseases of old age. Staggeringly costly, as I mentioned already. These are universal, these diseases. Some people think, well, some people get Alzheimer's, some people get tuberculosis, it's all much the same thing. Nonsense. Everybody gets Alzheimer's if they don't get anything else. It's not something that you can just avoid by being careful. You're going to get these things. So they're not medically curable in the sense that you can eliminate, you can do a one-off treatment that stops you from dying of tuberculosis until you get reinfected. It's not like that. But that doesn't mean that medicine for the diseases of old age is impossible. It just means we need a different type of medicine. In economic terms, again, coming, back to, coming now to medical research, we have the problem that people don't think of aging in the same category as they think of diseases. It's perfectly acceptable politically, and therefore it actually happens, to throw masses amount of money at research to try to cure Alzheimer's or atherosclerosis or cancer, even though the concept of a cure is inherently uh, misguided, as I've just explained. But apparently, this is not the case for aging. So these numbers up here are again from America. $30 billion gets spent every year on medical research by the National Institutes of Health. 3% of that is spent on the National Institute of Aging. That's not enough, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Unfortunately, within that, only about one-sixth is spent on research into the biology of aging. The rest is on things like geriatrics and social gerontology, so improving the dignity of the elderly, things like that. And out of that 150 million, less than 10%, certainly some people would argue less than 5%, is spent on actual research trying to do something about aging rather than just to understand it. So it's, it's insane. The, the um, foundation that's been created around my own work, Sense Research Foundation, based in California, is almost the same size. You know, our budget is around $5 million a year, and we're tiny. You know, that's just coming from philanthropy. So it's amazing. So then the question is, how are we going to develop medicine to do something about aging? And since this is a short talk, I can't go into too many details, but let me just basically summarize by saying that we are going to do it in the same way that we already successfully extend the healthy lifespan of simple man-made machines, like cars or whatever. And that's by preventative maintenance, periodic repair of pre-symptomatic damage. Geriatri geriatricians try to address and alleviate the diseases of old age by thinking of them and treating them as if they were normal diseases, like infections. And as I've explained, that is basically never going to work. Gerontologists normally try to slow down the accumulation of this damage by, in some way, tuning our metabolism, and the, our, norm our body's normal operations, so that it makes damage more slowly and postpones the time at which the damage reaches a pathogenic level. And that's also pretty much hopeless because our metabolism is just too complicated. But going in and periodically repairing this damage after it's happened, but before it reaches a pathogenic level of abundance, that's a much more promising approach. As I've said, it's very similar to how we keep cars on the road for 100 years, even though they were only designed to work for 10 or 15 years. And it turns out that when we start to look at the details of all of this, the actual down-to-earth biology of how we might do this repair and maintenance, it doesn't look quite so challenging, quite so daunting as it might have originally seemed. First of all, there are only seven major categories of damage that we need to worry about. Here they are. Things like cell loss. That's just cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. So the number of cells goes down and eventually things stop working so well. And I haven't got time to go down this list in detail, but you get the idea. Um, why do I know that this list is complete? Well, I don't know that it's complete, but things are looking pretty good. All of these things have been major topics of gerontologists' research since at least the early 1980s. So, you know, that's quite a long time ago. You'd think that the list would have got longer if it could. 
Plus, also, I've been actually explicitly challenging people to add to this list for more than a decade now, and it hasn't happened. So this is a classification that is standing the test of time, and that's pretty good news. Here's the next piece of good news. We can actually relate the types of damage that I've just listed to the diseases of old age in a pretty clear, explicit way. Sometimes it's a really simple relationship. So one of the types of damage that I've listed is cells dividing when they're not supposed to. And that's synonymous with cancer. Sometimes it's more complicated. Heart disease, there are lots of different types of heart disease in old age. Some of them are caused by cells dying and not being automatically replaced. That's, for example, why someone's heart may stop even though there's nothing really else wrong with them because they haven't got enough pacemaker cells. Sometimes we can have molecular garbage accumulating in some of the cells of the heart or the major arteries. That's what atherosclerosis is and causes heart attacks and strokes. Oh, I've gone backwards. Hang on. There you go. Um, sometimes it can be molecular garbage accumulating between cells. There's something called senile cardiac amyloidosis, which is very important in killing the very old, people over 100. And then there's stiffening of the lattice of proteins that keeps us uh, that, 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 that keeps our tissues in the shape they have. That lattice needs to be elastic. It gets less elastic with age, and that's called arteriosclerosis, the source of hypertension in the elderly, which causes things like kidney failure. So, again, it's complicated, but the relationship is nevertheless very clear and explicit. In Alzheimer's disease, you've got another sort of relationship where you've got one disease with three different types of symptoms. Again, you've got molecular garbage inside neurons called tangles. You've got molecular garbage outside called plaques. And you've got cells dying. How do we fix all this? It comes down to four types of therapy, all of which begin with R, as you can see. Replacing, removing, repairing, and reinforcing. Replacing cells that have died and not being automatically replaced. Removing garbage that's accumulating, whether it's molecular garbage or cellular. Repairing structures that you want to restore to function, like the extracellular matrix. And reinforcing. Sometimes we just actually change the structure of cells so that damage can occur and not cause pathology anyway. And you can fit each of these seven categories of damage into a type of maintenance of this sort. The specifics are here. I've already mentioned um, cell loss a little bit. Stem cell therapy is the generic solution to cell loss putting cells in that will divide and differentiate to replace the cells that have gone missing. Stem cell therapy is being used for some of the diseases of old age, like Parkinson's disease. It's not working well yet, but it's getting there. It's in clinical trials. And if I had longer, I would go down the whole of this list. I want to talk a little bit about this particular one because it's work that's quite, a, um, quite an important component of what Sense Research Foundation does. Cardiovascular disease is ultimately caused by the accumulation of oxidized cholesterol in certain cells of the artery wall. This is the beginning of atherosclerosis, looked at down the microscope. White blood cells turning into this kind of undead state called a foam cell. And we have found ways to stop this from happening. Um, we're interested in eliminating the major toxic molecule that causes white blood cells to become foam cells. It's called 7-ketocholesterol. And we found bacteria which were able to destroy this molecule. We found out how they did it using techniques like mass spectrometry to identify the genes and enzymes that were involved. We have taken those enzymes and modified them so that we can put them into human cells and so that the enzyme goes to the part of the cell where the toxic molecule accumulates. That's called the lysosome. And now, recently, just last year, we were able to show that these cells were protected. This graph, to, not to go into too many details, it shows that if the cells are making this enzyme and sending it to the right part of the cell, then they are protected against a concentration of toxin that would normally kill cells that don't have the enzyme, or cells that have the wrong enzyme, or cells that aren't targeting the enzyme to the lysosome. So this is pretty good news. We're pretty happy about this. But the fact is, aging is really complicated. Whenever anyone tells you that there's going to be some magic bullet, some single simple therapy that will postpone the diseases and disabilities of old age by a large amount sometime soon, you can absolutely be sure that they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> However, saying that, aging is not as complicated as many scientists have come to believe over the years. 
the classification that I gave you a moment ago of aging damage into only seven major categories seems to be a way of breaking the problem up in a divide and conquer way into manageable pieces. Each of these areas of research is at a relatively early stage. Only a few of them are getting to the point of clinical trials. So it may be another 20 or 25 years, it may be a lot longer than that before we finally get these therapies working. I think we've got at least a 50-50 chance of getting there within 20 or 25 years, though. And the critical thing is these are therapies which should work on people who are already 60 or 70 or older when the therapies first come along. So most people in this room have a good chance of benefiting. However, as I say, it's a divide and conquer strategy. We at Sense Research Foundation support a large number of projects at this point, near, nearly 20 projects, as well as having an educational initiative. We are getting traction here. This was a very heretical idea when I first put it forward a decade ago. But now we have people, such as you can see here, 25 extremely high-profile, world-leading scientists as advisors. These are people that, you know, the guy who invented the term regenerative medicine is on our research advisory board, things like that. We run conferences to show that this really is happening. Just a month or two ago, I ran a conference in Cambridge in England with, again, really, really world-leading scientists showing how rapidly we are progressing in making this work a reality. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can, of course, go to our website and have a look at the annual report or the research report that we produced. So the question is, what can you do to help? I'm doing my very best running around the world giving talks like this, giving interviews, orchestrating all of this research, but ultimately we've got to actually speed this up. I believe that this could go faster if we had more personnel involved, could go a lot faster if we had more, um, more work going on. So what can you do? Well, uh, you're not allowed to ask for money at TED, so this is me not asking for money. Um, uh, y y you can look at our website. You can, um, you can go and learn something about this. Students can go to our educational arm of our, of our um, website and find out more about doing internships, things like that. Researchers who are already established can choose a field that contributes to all of this. And the last one here is possibly the most important for most people in this room, advocacy. Get out there and persuade your friends, your colleagues, your family, anyone, that this is the world's most important problem. This is the problem that causes far more suffering than any other problem that the world experiences today. It's the problem that causes two-thirds of all deaths worldwide, 90% of all deaths in the industrialized world. It's something that needs to stop. I'm trying to make it stop. I want you to try to make it stop too. There's a book I wrote a few years ago which talks about all of the basic, all of the, all of the science here, the detailed science. There's a lot of it. This is a reasonably challenging book, but it doesn't require you to be a biologist to understand it, so I recommend it to you. And I will stop there. Thank you very much.